This is Perinex podcast number 48, and today we're talking about how aerodynamics can damage wind turbines over their lifespan and how this aerodynamic phenomena can really reduce the lifespan of a wind turbine and how to increase that. And to do that, we're going to look at a paper called A Long Wind Aerodynamic Damping of Wind Turbine Towers, Determination by Wind Tunnel Tests and Impact on Tower Lifetime. And this is an open access paper. You can find the link in the description if you want to play along at home. And here is a video of wind turbines if you've never seen one in operation. So in this paper, they identified that wind turbines during their lifetime, they, they vibrate around. And that's because when you have the flow going over a wind turbine, wind turbines are made up of that central shaft, which is the tower. And then at the top, you have these blades and you can have vertical axis and horizontal axis, but they all really still have that tower part to begin with. And that tower is cylindrical. It uh, has a circular cross section. And so you end up getting um, some shedding off of there, some periodic shedding at different frequencies, and that can cause vibrations. That Those vibrations, over time, weaken the tower until it finally um, becomes unsafe or can even fail. And the longer you can keep this tower in operation, the more efficient this tower will become over this lifetime because now you're using the same tower to generate more energy. And that's what we really want. So how can you reduce the damage to these turbines so that you can operate them longer. That's what this paper uh, aims to find out. So first of all, they say that the wind energy installation of approximately 93 gigawatts in 2020, wind energy now represents about 6% of the global power mix. So it produces 6% of the entire power, which is pretty amazing. In some countries, it's a lot higher. Like for example, Denmark, I think it's, I think it's almost hundred percent of Denmark, something like that. And Netherlands is not too far off that either. Anyway, they say that, so they've known about these wind turbines that they vibrate at different par parts of the tower and the blades. And they've, they've put a lot of effort into figuring out how to dampen the blades. And this is not only due to the mechanical setup, but also the blades themselves, how they are shaped so that the aerodynamics um, suit the application more. But less attention has been paid to the damping of the support structure. So the, the tower, which has this circular cross section. and the main reason for this is that the relatively small value of the towers are no damping in comparison to the rotors. So they're saying that people have looked into the rotor because that's usually the worst part, but also the tower now is becoming bad because they've improved the rotor so much. <laughs> and they say that the total damping for, let's say, a wind turbine that produces three megawatts. And this is important because, as we'll find out later, the more megawatts that you produce, the damping does change. They say for a three megawatt wind turbine, Total damping ratios for fore and aft um, vibration and side to side vibrations are 1.9 and 2.5% respectively. This is just for a regular wind turbine. So but how can we make this better so that it doesn't vibrate as much? They say that if you can increase these damping ratios of even half a percent, that can increase the turbine's lifetime of about 2.5 years. That's a huge amount. So that's like 10% or so increase in the lifetime. And then they say, well, we want to figure this out, but how can we figure this out? How can we figure out how to dampen this thing? So we need to do wind tunnel tests. The problem with wind turbines is that they're so big and you can't put a wind turbine in a, in a wind tunnel. So you need to make a, a scale model. And as we all know, you need to scale it. Um, one problem with this is that because wind turbines are so big that when you put them in the wind tunnels, they're like only a couple percent, if not less, of the regular size that you have in real life. So the similarity is just out the window. The Reynolds number you can't really match because if you push the Reynolds number too high, you start getting too compressible flow. So just the general rule of thumb is if you have a Mach number greater than 0 
the flow will now start to act like a compressible flow instead of incompressible. And um, that means that you're now getting compressibility effects and the flow physics is not going to be the same as lower velocities. And now in real life, a wind turbine does not operate in, compressible, in a compressible flow. It's below 0 0.3 Mach number. So in a wind tunnel, we have to go above that to get similarity, which then creates other problems. So there's a real problem there. So how can you attain this similarity? One way that they're looking at is to change the surface roughness of the tower. And the reason why they say that they want to increase the surface roughness is to increase the effective Reynolds number effectively. So I've gone into uh, the Reynolds number in other podcasts, particularly in podcast number 30, which is called How Do Turbulence Tensities Affect Airfoil Performance? I talk about how Reynolds number and turbulence intensity is very um, closely connected. And the Reynolds number is not the be-all and end-all. A lot of people use the Reynolds number to... Uh, tell you everything you need to know about the flow's condition in terms of whether it's turbulent or laminar. That's not really the case. I mean, in here, they, they're saying you can change the surface roughness and that will effectively change um, how chaotic, how turbulent the flow is, which is true. So it's not just the Reynolds number, it's not just the turbulence density as well. It's also the surface roughness and other parameters as well. So what they're saying here is if we can increase the surface roughness, we can kind of mimic the same... Uh, turbulence and Reynolds number as the full scale model. And the one thing that they're looking at is something called the critical Reynolds number. And they want to see how the surface roughness affects this critical critical Reynolds number. And this critical, critical Reynolds number is um, very important because this is where the wind turbines actually operate in. And this critical, critical Reynolds number is the Reynolds number at which the minimum drag occurs. So that's how they've defined it here. And they want to find out, um, and they want to kind of match that with their models. So in order to look at that, they had three different sandpapers that they put around the tower. And then they also put a dimple pattern. So the sandpapers, that's obvious, like you just have the, the central tower and you put sandpaper around it with different roughnesses from 40 grit to 120 grit. And then the dimples, though, this is quite cool. It's effectively like a golf ball pattern. So you know how the golf balls have those dimples in them? That's all around the tower. And they're testing these four different ones to see how they affect the critical Reynolds number and if they can get similarity that way. And they put it into a wind tunnel with a terms intensity of 11.5%. And that's quite high, but that's quite normal for an atmosphere. So there are two main types of wind tunnels in terms of their terms intensities. There's the aerodynamic wind tunnels, which have terms intensities usually around 1% or less, the lower the better. Or that you have atmospheric term, uh, wind tunnels, which have quite high uh, term intensities of 5%, 10%, or even higher. And they're to mimic regular atmospheric conditions. And they're used for wind engineering applications such as turbines and buildings. So in here, they've, they've put it into this kind of wind tunnel, which is 0.5% term intensity. Again, if you want to learn more about term intensity, check out podcast number 30, because I go through that quite a bit. And they have some cool little uh, cross sections of this tower. So you have the smooth one, then you have the finer paper, uh, sandpaper all the way to the dimples. And as the sandpaper increases, the roughness gets more jaggedy. And the dimples are um, as you'd expect. So one cool thing that they talk about is they say because the relative surface, uh, the roughness is not considered in the drag coefficient equation, each drag coefficient curve must be given with um, the corresponding equivalent of roughness or relative roughness. So let's talk about this for a second. So if you increase the surface roughness, that's going to affect the friction drag of an object. And what they're saying here is the regular drag coefficient doesn't really distinguish between the surface roughnesses of different objects. And that's true. It's all just lumped together. But also it doesn't affect just the friction drag. It will also affect the pressure drag. So the pressure drag is... Uh, very much related to the size of the wake. And the more you can roughen the surface, generally speaking, the smaller the wake will be because the flow is that attached longer around the cylinder and reduce the wake size. So that will affect the, the pressure drag. So that's why um, you have this quite complex effect happening between the friction drag and pressure drag. And you need to consider the surface roughness when you're talking about the drag coefficient. And this is actually something that is true for everything. Like, Whenever you look at the drag coefficient, you almost never hear or you almost never read what the 
friction the um, surface roughness is. And that's a major problem. I remember actually in one paper that I did, I was sanding some stuff down and I managed to figure out what the surface roughness was and I reported that and I remember that people were quite excited about that because now <laughs> you have that information which you usually don't and that's a big factor in terms of how something will perform, especially if it's in the transitional regime for um, turbulence. So they say that um, consequently larger surface roughnesses will increase the drag coefficient in all flow regimes and a, reduce, a reduction in the critical Reynolds number. So when they said that an increase in the drag coefficient in all flow regimes, that's not necessarily true. That's only for the friction drag. The pressure drag may reduce. So you may get an overall reduction in the drag coefficient and that could just depend on the application and the, the flow that you have. So the value of the critical Reynolds number is particularly important because um, this is what they want to test in, in the wind tunnels. So they want to see what uh, surface roughness will give them the right critical Reynolds number. And what they found was, as you'd expect, as you increase the surface roughness all the way to the dimples, the critical Reynolds number drops dramatically. And that's very important because that means now you can start mimicking a little bit of the um, real life conditions with just increasing surface roughness. One thing I should mention is the Reynolds number, strictly speaking, tells you how um, disturbances in a flow will act over time whether they will grow or whether they will get suppressed so the Reynolds number is not really a characteristic of the surface roughness or um, even whether a flow is turbulent or not it will just tell you whether the disturbances will grow or not because it's the ratio of um, inertia versus viscosity so that means that the wake will the wake breakdown will not necessarily be the same just because you have the same critical Reynolds number it could still be different because the Reynolds number is actually different in real life. So that's one thing to, to keep in mind. But what they noticed is, as I mentioned, the increased surface roughness drops the critical Reynolds number and it will also drop the transitional Reynolds number as well, maybe from 500,000 to 200,000 or whatever, something like that. And then they have um, a figure, which is quite cool. We don't see this too often. The critical Reynolds number as a function of the relative roughness. And what they found is, as with literature, as you increase the relative roughness, the critical Reynolds number drops and you expect that. And okay, so I might actually ex explain why that is. Um, so here, um, when you drop the, when you increase the surface roughness, then you, as I said, you mentioned, I mentioned you get the uh, potential drop in the pressure drag. And that is um, a good thing for cylinders. And that's why you get the critical Reynolds number dropping there. So let's go on to the damping of the wind turbines with circular sections. So this first part of the paper, they were just looking at how to get similarity for their wind turbine. And that's they had to do all this work just to <laughs> figure out how to get similarity. <laughs> now they're looking at the damping. And they tested again all the different, um, I don't know, they tested a few different sandpaper roughnesses and the dimples. But now they have a different setup because they want to get a high frequency um, load cell. So the load cell measures the forces. They want to figure out what the damping ratio is based on the frequencies of the vibrations. So they have to now figure out whether their new wind turbine setup is going to be the same as their old one, which they investigated the surface roughness on. It's very complicated and it was, it seems like it was quite a big headache for them. Now they've found that the, the um, sandpaper roughnesses were fine. They got the exact same um, trends they expected and the same values. However, the dimples, they performed slightly, slightly differently. They had a different um, critical Reynolds number and drag coefficients. And that said, they said that is possibly due to the dimples that were drilled into the, the new aluminum cylinders were too rough and sharp. And that is definitely a possibility. So when you have burrs on a surface, or not rounded corners, that's going to change the flow physics definitely on a surface, particularly burrs. Burrs, you can get vortices forming and then they can re-energize the flow. They can act effectively like micro vortex generators. So having different surface roughnesses and different finishes, so the two rough potentially having burrs very sharp, that can affect the, the um, flow physics. So they talk about, a lot, they have a lot of equations. I'm not gonna go through them because they're, they're quite boring and they don't really you don't need to know them. If you want to go through them, you can just download the paper and go through them. They're not that difficult. But let's go to the results. 
So they say in the first step, the damage of each wind turbine, or of each, each wind speed, sorry, is calculated for all the simulations with and without aerodynamic damping. The tower section zone with higher damage is studied. So before we go any further, I just want to say, make sure to check out the instrumentation we do here at Primax. We have the MSU Hawk, we have the RV, and we have reverses. We also have a new method called Rayleigh scattering, and this will improve your, your experiments greatly. The MSU Hawk, for example, that makes sure you don't have any errors in your density of air. And most aerodynamics do not measure the density of air, which is a massive problem, uh, because you can have a, easily an error of 2 or 3% on a regular day in that. And you're carrying that forward into everything that you do, including the validation of CFD. And that's very bad. So check out uh, instrumentation. Check out our courses as well. We do theory like this in CFD and experiments. So links in the description. So let's get to the, the results. What they found was that as you increase the wind speed, the damping has a greater effect. So the damping went from, as expected, they say the effect of aerodynamic damping is more pronounced for higher wind speeds. The total normalized damage in the simulations without aerodynamic damping is 1.43% higher than in the simulations with aerodynamic damping. So that means that the life expectancy can increase up to 0.7% if you have damping or more damping. That means that with 0.7%, that's a huge increase in life expectancy just with a little bit more damping, which means that your wind turbine becomes more efficient. And it means that the, air, the vortex shedding is not moving your, your tower around as much. One thing that I might be interested in is how that would affect the sound. So if you're damping some of the vibration, that might help reduce some of the sound that comes off of wind turbines. And I'm not sure if you know, but um, the sound that comes off wind turbines is, has been a massive talking point among people, especially among people who live next to wind turbines. They say that they um, feel sick out of it. So that's one major reason why uh, wind turbine areas have not gone up. So by reducing the, the noise, that could be beneficial for that. And that's an aeroacoustic effect. So they in figure 12, they now plot the aerodynamic damping of wind turbines with operating speeds as a function of um, with um, the size of the wind turbine. And what they found was that the increase in the power um, output increases the damping of the wind turbine to begin with. So they say that if you increase the the power coming out of a wind turbine by 2.5 megawatts, the damping ratio also increases by about 0.1%. What that means is that bigger wind turbines have a greater damping ratio, which means that they have a greater lifespan from that point of view. Smaller wind turbines have a lower damping ratio, which means that they will suffer more damage and reduce their life expectancy from the, this phenomenon. So that's quite interesting. And also as the wind speed increases, the damping ratio also increases now, it's not a huge slope, like at 3 meters per second, the damping ratio is approximately 0.05%. At 25 meters per second, it's approximately 0.4%. So, okay, it's a, an increase of 8, um, but you're increasing the velocity by a huge amount. So it's not a very large slope, which is why perhaps having other aerodynamic damping um, devices are a good idea, and increasing the size of the wind turbine to begin with. In fact, actually, the bigger the wind turbine, the, the um, generally speaking, the bigger wind turbine, the, the greater the slope it seems. So they say that the damping ratio is then directly proportional to the wind turbine hub height and average diameter, because this, these two parameters increase the power that you're taking out of the air. But it's also inversely proportional to the general mass and the first natural frequency. So the higher these two values, the um, lower the the damping ratio. So in conclusion, they say that uh, the aerodynamic coefficients of cylinders with circular cross sections and different surface roughnesses were determined in wind tunnel tests with um, quite high terms densities. And they say that um, if you have a wind turbine with higher damping ratios, so for example, um, a six megawatt wind turbine and you increase the damping ratio by 0.7%, then you can increase the lifetime expectancy of 0.4%. So that's the end of this podcast. Make sure to like, subscribe, and show all your friends who are interested in wind turbines as well. Peace out, amigos.